All right. So, well, should we start with a joke? Yes, let's please start with a joke. I think I have a good one for you. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Did you hear about the bald man who got a great deal on a wig? I did not. It was only a dollar. It was a small price to pay. Oh, oof. (laughs) Come on, that's good. I, I always struggle with those because I imagine. All right, I have a little a little tale to tell. Okay. Um, I like to make up terrible jokes. Um, I'm trying to make one. We call them in my house twoist jokes, because twoist. Yeah. Um. So one time I made a joke about a very small forest, and I said forest more like a twoist. <laughs> and so, okay. <laughs> so I make a lot of these jokes. Um. And then it's kind of become a thing in our house where I make the joke and my partner, Cassie, does not enjoy it. Um, So then I kind of pretend like I don't understand why she doesn't enjoy it. And so overly explain it to like. (laughs) Nothing better than an overly explained joke. (laughs) Yeah. As if like the problem with the joke is that she didn't get it (laughs) as opposed to it's a terrible joke. (laughs) And I enjoy this deeply and she hates it. Um, and so I always thought it would be very funny to me to write like a joke book that has a joke like the two page joke and then written below it is like a two paragraph complete explanation of why it's funny. Um, cause so you see, when you say it aloud, it's different than when you read it in print. I debated between because you see, a dollar is not a lot for a win. <laughs> And to pay is another word for wig. It also sounds like to pay. Yeah, it would be the world's Get it? worst joke book. Because it'd be like, <laughs> wow, you killed any modicum of fun that exists. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that, that one just lit up that part of my brain. So I kind of hated it and then loved it. Excellent. <laughs> you know, I think that's the sweet spot for a bad joke. Well, everybody listening, welcome to uh, Why Did You Read That? Uh, I'm Peter. I'm Megan. And uh, we're going to talk about some books uh, with the implied question of, now, why did you read that? (laughs) (laughs) No judgment implied. Most times, yeah. Most times. Most times. You know, we wouldn't judge other readers of books ever, but, you know, between friends, I feel like (laughs) it's okay to pass some light judgment. Okay. Fair enough. I'm, I think I do it unconsciously anyway. So yeah. It's fine. Well, and you know, I can stand up to it. I, I feel okay with that. Some of the things that I read, I feel like warrant judgment. So sure. Me too. <laughs> I'm a grown up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'd like to make arguments against negative judgments of them, but someone who was not skeptical of some of the, you know, last episode, I think, or two ago, I mentioned clown fellas. And, I think it was uh, last week. Yeah, someone who didn't raise an eyebrow month. at that, I'd be like, okay, you don't have to flatter me that much. I I acknowledge it's not normal. Yeah, fair enough. I've read some things. All right, so... <laughs> I every, think you go first. I think I do. Um, all right, so here are my four options, and then you can pick one, and I will talk about it. All right. So one is um, a comic book. I only did one comic book this time. Wow. So Really uh, reining yourself in. I know. I really restrained myself this time. Uh, it's called She-Hulk, Single Green Female by Dan okay. Slott. Um, my second one is Consider This by Chuck Palahniuk. Uh The third is Providence by Max Berry. And the fourth is a book called Kathleen Hale is a Crazy Stalker. By Kathleen Hale. All right. So you want to give me a, like a quick one sentence rundown on these? Oh, I probably should, huh? Yeah. Um, good help. She Hulk, single green female. So uh, I'm guessing most people are at least visually vaguely familiar with She Hulk. Uh, mm-hmm. She Hulk is a lady Hulk. And the big difference between She Hulk and Hulk Hulk, Hulk classic, is that. Um, Sometimes Hulk Hulk kind of 
when he turns into Hulk, he gets dumber. Um, she Hulk retains her intelligence and personality for the most part when she is the She Hulk, and she can okay. kind of transform back and forth at will. Uh, so, so she's Avengers Endgame Hulk. Yeah, basically. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so this kind of involves some. So She Hulk's uh, alt alternate alter ego. Or I don't know if She-Hulk is the alter ego of Jen Walters or if it's vice versa. But anyway, Jen Walters is an attorney. Um, so this kind of involves that side of her life. Okay. Um, Consider This is by Chuck Palahniuk, and it's basically a book of writing advice. Um, that uh, I, I've read quite a few books of that type, and this is one of the very few that I really, really enjoyed. Okay. Uh, Providence by Max Berry is a sci-fi shoot 'em up action fighting the aliens thing. Okay. And then Kathleen Hale is a crazy stalker is a book of essays, um, including there's one that was uh, addressed a very controversial incident where I guess she showed up on the doorstep of someone who reviewed one of her books. Yeah, I remember this. <laughs> this was a big deal. Yeah, this made a lot of waves in the in the reading world. Yes. Yeah, and the sort of like tight insular world of especially Goodreads um, reviews and stuff like that. This was like the biggest thing ever. And then yeah. probably everyone outside that world is like, I've never heard of this. Hmm. Okay, well, let's see. Where do I want to go? I think let's start with Providence. Okay. Um... Well, let me start by saying I'm not like the biggest sci-fi reader. Um, yeah, that's part of why I'm picking it, because I don't know that you read sci-fi that often that I'm aware of. So I really I was intrigued. Yeah, I really don't. For the most part, sci-fi, I'll enjoy some sci-fi where the science fiction element is kind of um, used to tell a story about something else. So mm -hmm. like... Uh, there's a book called How to Live Safely in a Science Fiction Universe, or Fictional, by Charles Yu. And it's about time travel, but it's not really about time travel. It's kind of about how your life shapes your present and whatever. Okay. Or there's one called The Forever War that I highly recommend, which is kind of about fighting space aliens like Starship Trooper style, but it's really about the author's experience uh, going to and coming back from Vietnam War. Okay. So this one is um, unusual for me because it's pretty hard sci-fi premise. There's not like a ton of uh, real world parallel. So basically, um, there's the characters are on a spaceship called Providence, and they're kind of going into deep space to fight um, these aliens, which are basically like space wasps, I guess is the best way to describe them. Um, murder hornets <laughs> yeah kind of yeah and they somehow got in space and we're just like oh we can live out here all right <laughs> so they're kind of like um hunting down hives of these space wasps to eliminate them um and they're on this ship called providence and providence has like really super mega advanced uh, uh artificial intelligence so it does everything for them like it decides where to go for them. It fights the battle for them, you know, and they're kind of all just sitting around watching it happen all the time. Okay. So then, um, you know, because it's a book, things start to go off the rails. It kind of starts when, like, um, one of the characters starts acting erratically. And uh, he's um, he's kind of like a soldier type character. And so naturally, because the ship is doing everything and he doesn't have to do anything, he becomes extremely bored. <laughs> and so he kind of convinces another character that um, a good leisure activity is they run around the ship with um, throwing stars like a ninja would have in a movie and hit each other with them, you know, and they have like advanced medical technology. So it heals them almost instantly. Um then he kind of gets hooked on like space age painkillers 
And, you know, they're all supposed to go to their battle stations whenever they're fighting the enemy. But he just completely stops doing that because he's like, why? I don't do anything. Um, and then other characters kind of also start going off the rails in their own ways. So there's like uh, primarily there's kind of an environmental, you know, ship's environment person who handles all that. There's a captain and then there's a, a sort of an IT guy, I guess, a space <laughs> IT guy. <laughs> and um, anyway, I think what makes it interesting is it's, uh, you know, I kind of said it's not really about something else, but you could definitely interpret it as uh, the way artificial intelligence exists in our world and like is kind of taking over the things that we used to do to feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. um, and also what that means. And then, you know, there's also this side implication of like, they're not even entirely sure, like, they don't know what the life cycle of these space wasps is. They don't really know much about them, just that they're bad. And so, right. you know, there's I kind of... I that they're bad because they, like, are killing people? Yeah, they killed a bunch yeah. of people. Okay. Um, but, you know, so there's kind of like that moral ethical dilemma going yeah. on and like the space wasps are not communicative in any way they're not like uh right i guess i would say they're not like intelligent life per se right they're more like drones of a larger thing so anyway it's okay. it's interesting and it's kind of like there's enough that relates it to our real lives that keeps it interesting and i guess it's sci-fi but not with like laser swords and stuff right um you know, or I don't know, uh, spaceship battles are not like a spaceship dogfights are not like really a part of this. <laughs> so I think no I, Star Wars type. Yeah, it's very yeah. character driven. Um, OK. And you do get invested in some of the characters. You you kind of get invested in all of them. But uh, Max Berry is the author. He does a really good job doing bizarre premises, but kind of making them seem sensible did he write lexicon yes okay i've read that one yeah so that one and i found that very interesting it does a similar thing i think because it's about like magic being tied into words and intent behind words and language and all of that and I, that's something that as a longtime reader i really find interesting so yeah he's really good at he kind of like picks up a, an idea and runs with it and takes it to um a little beyond its logical conclusion to mm -hmm. a more interesting place. He did one called Machine Man that I really liked, which was about an engineer who had a, a workplace accident and lost, you know, half of his leg. And so, but, you know, he was an engineer, so he designed a replacement. But the problem he started having was that his replacement was superior to his original uh, biological leg. And so it was kind of outperforming his uh, original leg on the other side. Mm -hmm. So then he, you know, his tipping over into going too far was then he removed his other biological leg so he could replace it with a twin uh, mechanical leg. And then, you know, he's like, oh, well, I've got the lower half, but the upper half can't keep up with the lower half, you know, so he... <laughs> He kind of keeps <laughs> working his way into being more and more of a machine. And, uh, you know, he makes it seem you're not quite there, but you're like, this almost makes sense. And that kind of scares me that I'm thinking that. But yeah, here we are. I don't know if you've heard this, but um, I think it's a, a, a relatively common saying. And I'm probably going to get it slightly wrong, but it's something like um, science fiction reflects the fears of the society that's writing it. Yeah. It's like. You know, back in the, the 80s, you got a lot of like environmental and actually I think we're back to that, like this climate disaster sci-fi right? or, you know, like alien sci-fi when people are worried about, you know, immigration or whatever, mind control, like people write those kinds of. Are you there? Oh, yep. OK, sorry. I thought I lost you for a second. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I've. I, it feels like he's writing that kind of sci-fi. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, and this one, when I say like, you know, AI taking over things and making human life less fulfilling, um, 
I think what's good about his books too is he doesn't like overdo it. He doesn't slap right. you across the face with a the idea, and he, he he's kind of uh, he doesn't necessarily take a side on it, which is mm-hmm. something that I like. I know some readers prefer a more transparent, like uh, telling someone maybe a little how they should feel about it or suggesting how they should mm-hmm. feel about it, and he's very. Uh, tries to say neutral on that. And I appreciate that because I think it's more interesting to decide for myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of a providence. That's as much as I can say about providence without getting spoilery and stuff. But um, (laughs) I would say the other thing is like, if you're not digging it right away, give it give it a little time. It kind of goes into the individual characters in more depth after everything is introduced and i think that's when it like really hits its stride okay all right i think that that's good information to have you know knowing when should i give up on a book if i'm going to give up because there's nothing worse than not being into a book and worrying that you know the next chapter is where it gets good but i gave up totally yeah i think (laughs) people are getting more familiar with that kind of talk because like with uh you know serial television being such a big thing and someone's mm-hmm. like, oh, you got to watch Mad Men. But then you're like, well, how many episodes in and I'm not into it? Should I be like, OK, you're not going to enjoy this. Right. Or, you know, how many episodes yeah. in? got to get through the first season. Got to yeah. get through the first season. <laughs> yeah. Or like video games are that way sometimes. Right. Where it's right. like, yeah, look, you got to plow through the first hour because right. that's just that's all tutorial. Yeah, it's boring. All right. I'm ready to hear right. about your books. All right. I also have four books and one graphic novel. (laughs) Uh, So the graphic novel is called Adler by Levi Tadar and illustrated by Paul McCaffrey. And it is basically like um, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, only with female characters, I would say. Like if I were going to give it a real short, punchy description. Old literary characters. Yeah. And some uh, some real historical ones. But um but focusing on literary characters. Um, Adler refers to Irene Adler from the Sherlock Holmes stories. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, my second book is You'll Never Believe What Happened to Lacey uh, by Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar. And Amber Ruffin is a comedian and Lacey Lamar is her sister. And it's basically the two of them talking about, um, in, a, in a funny conversational way, about the kinds of everyday racism they encounter. So, which is a serious topic, but under like addressed in a really like stand up y, funny, um, anecdotal way. Gotcha. Then I've got A Curious Beginning by Deanna Rayborn. And that is a historical mystery series called the Veronica Speedwell Mysteries about uh, an independent, she's, she kind of makes her money by collecting butterfly specimens and selling them to collectors uh, and solves, solves crimes. And this is the first in that series. Is she solving and, crimes in the like butterfly collecting world or is that? Um, no, that's just um, she travels the world. And so this kind of gets her out into a bunch of different environments and encountering different people because she might be in like the first book takes place in London. But she goes to, you know, India and the Amazon and she travels around looking for butterflies. And so gotcha. different kinds of crimes in different places. Gotcha. That's her metaphorical mystery machine taking her from place to place. Sure. <laughs> they never really talked about that, did they? Like, where were those guys going? Yeah, they were just driving around. I guess it was the, the 70s. They were just seeing what the world had to offer. <laughs> Living that Jack Kerouac life. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> and then my fourth book is, I'm actually reading the sequel to this book, but it would be spoilery to talk about the sequel. So I'm going to talk about the first book, which is called A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. And I would describe it as a grown-up Harry Potter if Harry Potter were focusing on a young Voldemort. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Well, um, I think we should start with a deadly education. I feel like there are a lot of people who talk about, you know, Harry Potter adjacent stuff. Yeah. Well, and I have to admit that I sped through this book like a speed demon. Like it, it's not that long. It's considered epic fantasy, but 
it's relatively short and filled with lots of action. So I found it to be a really quick and compelling read. Um, it's the first in Naomi Novik's new series, which is called the Scholomance series. Um, the second book, I'm reading an early copy, but I think it's out relatively soon, like in the next month or two. Uh, so if you read this now, the second book should be available pretty quickly. Um, so the Scholomance is what they call like the wizarding school. Um, so all of the, not all of, uh, if you are fortunate enough, you get sent to the Scholomance when you are a young wizard. It's kind of like high school um, or maybe a combination of high school and college uh, for wizards. And you go there and it's super dangerous. Um, they, so the, the magical energy that wizards have um, attracts these creatures that feed on it. And when the school was built, they built it with like lots of safety features. But over time, those safety features had broken. And so now the, the school is filled with these these monsters that want to eat all of the students. Um, but it's still safer to be in there than it is to be out in the world because you're you're in there with a group of other wizards and you can create these alliances and, you know, try to survive by watching each other's backs and whatever. <laughs> So it's super dangerous, but still a better option. And also you kind of, the school feeds you spells and things based on, you know, how you do stuff. So you, you become a better wizard by being there. So that's why people still go. And the main character's name is Galadriel, which I find hysterical because she's prophesied to be a dark sorceress who will destroy the world. <laughs> Her name is Galadriel. She goes by L, uh, and she's pretty much a loner. She stays away from people. Um, she, so she has all of this power and could basically do whatever she wanted, um, successfully, but all of her magic tends to veer in a, a negative or an evil way. And her mother is like a, a, an earth healer type. And so she's been raised as much as she can to be a, a good person, but she has this tendency, like all of her spells turn evil. So she's very careful. She does small spells. All of her classmates think that she's fairly weak um, because she refuses to do big spells because she's afraid that she would accidentally, like not only would she kill all the monsters in the school, but all of her fellow students as well um, without even thinking about it. So she's um, trying to make her way through school and get out. Um, and there, she has a polar opposite student whose name is Orion. And he is essentially the exact opposite of her. He effortlessly saves all of his fellow students. Um, he kind of can tell when somebody's getting attacked and he'll show up and he'll kill the creature and everyone, you know, hero worships him. He's like everyone's hero. And he's even saved Elle several times and <laughs> she's mad about it. I was <laughs> so about to say like she's him. annoyed about by <laughs> Yeah, he Thanks basically for saving my life, I nerve. guess. <laughs> <laughs> so the first book is basically an entire school year, and it's going over. Um, so to get out, so when you graduate, basically, graduation is you leaving the school, but the exit, the big hall that exits the school is filled with the most monsters and the, the scariest ones. So it basically becomes, a, are you able to get out without getting killed? And you have to form, like generally you have to form an alliance of other wizards and work together and try to get out without getting killed. And hopefully other teams will, you know, provide distractions so that you can get out. <laughs> and so she's in this position where she has to figure out how she's going to graduate without dying. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, nobody likes her because she's grumpy. Um, which I really like about her. I find her really fun to read because she is so grumpy. And the only person who seems to like her is Orion, who she can't stand. <laughs> and probably because she's the only person in the school who doesn't hear or worship him. Right. <laughs> um, everybody thinks that she doesn't have a lot of power when in actuality, she just keeps herself on an extremely short leash. So it's like um, a Voldemort who doesn't want to destroy the world, but also has that like that pull and could so easily do it. And like with one stumble, you know, she, she could destroy the entire school and everyone in it. Hmm. Um, so it's, I found it really interesting um, and fun. The, the world building is really like unusual. She, she brings in people from all different cultures. You can 
do language tracks and like you learn spells and other languages and the more you so if you start to learn just a little bit too much of anglo-saxon english all of a sudden the school will decide that you're going to get all your spells in anglo-saxon and then you're like studying it all the time uh-huh. so super interesting um the i feel like i should mention and i'm not going to go too deep into it but a few people have said that they found some uh, racist issues with the book i will say that i didn't see anything like that um and but the editor has decided that in the next edition of this book there will be a couple of small um references to things that will be removed to address that so if this is something that you're worried about i would say um, go online you can probably find some information about specifically what it is but i didn't see any big problems with this um and i found it to be really really fun and fast reading um great for summer i think yeah that sounds uh pretty good it was I gotta, great honest. And, yeah, yeah fantasy really is like it. my and other speak through the second <laughs> Fantasy is like my other one that I'm not usually into, but I'm like, eh, this sounds all right. Yeah, I would recommend it, especially like if you've read Harry Potter, or you've seen the movies and you found them at all enjoyable, but would like a maybe a less nice. No, I'm going to use the word juvenile, but I don't mean like juvenile is in like stupid. I mean, juvenile is in aimed at a young audience. Sure. If you're looking for something for a more mature reader, I think this will will hit that bill. Well, that seems like something a lot of people would be looking for. I because I yeah. guess you know the Harry Potter generation is yeah <laughs> older now. I don't know twenty. <laughs> yeah, like We're not kids anymore. <laughs> I was just trying to do the math and was thinking like, oh my goodness, they're <laughs> they're yeah. probably like in their twenties. Oh, I think they're older than that because they were you know probably what ten when they started reading them. Oh and yeah, it's been Good twenty point. years. Yeah, that's true. Holy cow. Yeah, their parents themselves. And like Maybe. Old. Yeah. If you grew up with Harry Potter, you're old. What happened? Let's not talk about it. Where did time go? <laughs> I grew up with Scooby Doo, so I really don't want to talk about that's it. That's true. We were just talking about the mystery machine. Like I know. That's a we're thing. so old. <laughs> well, that sounds like a good a good one. And I you know, forever like people were asking for things that I think kind of scratch that harry potter itch Mm -hmm. um other than harry potter because you know they weren't interested in it for various reasons or like they've read it five times or whatever yeah just want more of that good good fantasy yeah and it was always kind of difficult to find things that seemed satisfactory so yeah there were things that i would recommend to people but never anything that felt really the same it was more like this is adult focused fantasy about like wizards and there's a school in it but yeah. it's not really the same. This, I think, is the closest I've ever read to really being like that kind of book. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. All right. Excellent. All right. So that's uh, A Deadly Education. Titles? Yes, A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Um, my remaining titles are She-Hulk, Single Green Female, uh, Consider This, and Kathleen Hale is a Crazy Stalker. Hmm. You know, I am just too interested in Kathleen Hale as a crazy stalker. <laughs> That's fair. Um, so this is a book of essays by Kathleen Hale. Before this, she'd written one or maybe two um, like young adult novels. And uh, I, guess, I guess the best way to talk about this is to talk about the sort of uh, titular incident. The scandal. Um, yeah. So... Uh, there's two very different versions of the story. And one is the one that's told by the reviewer Blythe, I think her name is. And the other one is Kathleen Hale's version of the story. Um, Blythe's version of the story is basically that she gave Kathleen Hale's, one of her young adult books, a, a bad review. And Kathleen Hale showed up on her doorstep one day. Um... And, you know, she was naturally very disturbed by this and she told everyone about it and everyone on Goodreads and in the book world was kind of, um, you know, you'd you'd read stories about this on your, uh, I'm trying to think of like a website type, like your, your BuzzFeeds, but maybe a little better than BuzzFeed. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Huffington Post or yeah, that kind yes. of a... Yeah, your Huffington Post or your like, is Vulture, is that still a thing? I have no idea. <laughs> Whatever. You get what I'm saying. I, um, I, I gotcha. 
You'd read about it on those sites that aren't like news news sites, but, you know, cover these sort of smaller niche things. Um, Almost like news gossip. Yeah. And it kind of became this big conversation about like, hey, you know, what what is a person who reads a book? What's their rights as a reviewer and what's the right of a creator? Mm hmm. Well, and so then that was the the sort of big narrative out there. And Kathleen Hale didn't really say much about it for quite a while. And then she put out this book, which included an essay um, about her side of that story. And so the interesting thing when this book came out was that um, a bunch of people reviewed it, you know, like one star, none star. And just like, I can't believe that someone would publish this, you know, because it I guess some people felt it was. Similar to similar in ethic, but not in scale to like if Ted Bundy wrote a novel and you published it, it's like that doesn't seem like great. (laughs) Um, But uh, so her side of the story is pretty different. Her side of the story and these are all her claims. And I the weird thing about it is you've got Blythe's side, you've got Kathleen's side, and there's really no way for an individual to know which is 100% correct or like 80% correct. So the way she puts it is that um, she put out this book and this reviewer gave it a negative review, but it wasn't just a negative review. It accused Kathleen Hale of being um, like a rape apologist and some other pretty, pretty horrible things. And um, it was Kathleen Hale's opinion that none of the content in the novel indicated these things. So it, for her, it just felt like, I guess, a very unfair review. Um, But then the bigger issue is that Kathleen claims that Blythe um, was sort of playing this role of innocent reviewer, you know, average person, whatever, and that this was completely untrue. And that within um, publishing houses and literary circles, she and some other people were like known figures for doing weird things online that kind of promoted some books and really demoted other books um, for kind of various unknown agenda, I guess. And so uh, through the course of the essay, Kathleen Hale kind of flips it a little bit and is like, who's the real victim here is kind of the, the story of it. Um, And then she talks about how she tried to talk to Blythe, but could never get in touch with her. And then there was a website that offered uh, people the chance to be interviewed by someone of just someone of their choice. You know, so like an author might pick to be interviewed by their father or someone might be interviewed by their best friend or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so she extended the offer of this interview to Blythe as a chance to talk to her and Blythe turned it down. So through the course of all this, she kind of discovered that Blythe uh, was not who she was presenting herself to be online. She was presenting herself to, you know, with an image and and I think a a teacher in an elementary school or something like that. And that the person who was writing as her was not that person. Um, So it's not like identity theft because Blythe wasn't a real person, but it was sort of false identity. And catfishing maybe a little bit? Yeah, kind of. And I kind guess of. the big problem with it is that um, Blythe was reviewing things based on her uh, catfishing identity. So, mm-hmm. you know, she was saying, like, as an educator and right. someone who her works with youth. And, yeah. And uh, but that was not who she was at all. So then Kathleen Hale uh, basically was stalking her online. And found all this out and then somehow found out where she lived and did decide to go to her house. Um, And she went up to the door and I don't remember if she rang the doorbell or not. And then she left. And the way she narrates it in the essay is she's like the whole time. She's like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, After this, uh, she completely spiraled. This was sort of the. Uh, midpoint of her downward spiral. She made like a suicide attempt after this. 
Um, she was in like a mental health, you know, facility for quite a little while after this. Um, so it's very interesting to read the essay because I feel like she doesn't, she's not trying to excuse what she did. Um, she's kind of talking about like, here's the worst decision I ever made. Um, mm -hmm. but she's also talking a lot about something that I think is important, which is, um, you know, 30 years ago, you could be an author and people could have opinions about your books or whatever, but generally it was like a professional critic was the only person you would see. And generally a professional critic would not say horrible things about your personal character, um, mm -hmm. especially based on a novel. Um, if you, I guess if you wrote some bizarre, you know, alleged nonfiction book and whatever, but based on a novel probably wouldn't attack you personally. Um, and that the current world of publication, she felt very pushed into like having a presence on social media and like um, her yeah. publisher was very insistent. You know, she'd never used like Twitter or anything before. And then she went into this and I think she had some line in it about, she feels that um, authors are sort of expected to be these, uh, just endless sponges of criticism from, mm -hmm. you know, random people and like very personal criticism and very um, aggressive criticism. And uh, that she doesn't think that's quite right. So she kind of lands at this point of like what she did wasn't right, but also what was done to her was not right and is being done to other people. Um. So it was, I think what was interesting about it is the book came out several years after the event. Mm -hmm. And um, it was interesting to read this other side of the story that, you know, may or may not be totally accurate, but I think presents it as a more complicated story, which does make me inclined to believe certain parts of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it does bring up this issue of, you know, like for lack of a better term, cyberbullying and like how maybe that's not just a problem for kids and, um, you know, how the sort of new world of amateur criticism can have some good things to it, but it can also have some really bad aspects as well. Yeah, that's a thing that I think about a lot because um, I'm not an author. Um, I'm a reader and I'm also a reader's advisor. So I'm, you know, a librarian who works with readers and one of the things I think about a lot in, in the context of my job, uh, especially as someone who reads romance, is that there is a tendency uh, among readers to gatekeep or shame other people's reading. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that I try to be very careful about not doing um, because I do think that every book has a reader and there's no shame in reading anything that brings you joy. Um, that if you are enjoying a book, then that's awesome, regardless of what the book is. And when I'm on social media like Goodreads um, and I see that someone, someone obviously had a terrible experience reading a book and got no joy out of it. And I, I understand that we've all had that experience, but sometimes I feel like they take it so personally or they, they judge the, their experience is suddenly substituted for the book. You know, right. my experience was bad. The book was bad or the author is bad. And I really wish that we could all get into the habit of saying like this book, you know, was a terrible read for me. Right. Um, I, this book is not for me. I didn't like it, you know, rather than this book is terrible. Right. Yes, I agree totally. And I also feel like um, it's, you know, it's fine to really dislike a book and stuff. And it's for me, it crosses the line when people start kind of trashing the author. Um, yeah. Because, you know, if you, I don't know, I think if you stop and think for a minute, you're like, well, wait a minute. I'm mad at this person because they sat down and wrote a novel that I didn't like. I mean, <laughs> maybe it's not about me. And right. so it's OK that they wrote that. It's OK that there are novels that I don't like and it's right. OK for them to exist. You know, I I kind of reserve, I think, my more harsh criticisms for, well, I'll, I'll use them sometimes on a classic because I'm like, 
and that dude's been dead for 150 years. Like, sure, it's fine. Um, but also something that I feel was like mismarketed or sold to me as being something that it's not. Yeah. Or, um, something that's generally a publishing issue, though. Yes. Publishers are like every everyone wants the new Gone Girl. This isn't really like that, but we'll just tell everyone it's the new Gone Girl. Yeah. And or... they'll buy it. <laughs> I remember I was reading Bad Feminist by Roxane Gay, and that's kind of sold as being a funny book. Yeah, and like, it's heavy. Yeah, th- I don't think it's funny. I, I think it's like interesting and there's good writing, but yeah. to be sold as uh, funny, I thought was odd. Yeah, there's a lot <laughs> about being like an assault survivor. And, yeah. Like trauma. And yeah, that's. That's that's a heavy read. <laughs> yeah, I mean, pretty heavy discussion of like gender, sexuality, race, all these things. I mean, yeah. it would be like if you saw, you know, Between the World and Me, ta Coates, and it's like hilarious romp. Yeah. And you're like, I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who that was who felt that. Yeah. It almost made me feel like whoever did that blurb hadn't actually read the book. Was just yeah. like familiar with Roxanne Gay from Twitter or something where she is funny. She and is funny. Yeah. It was like, oh, this book's probably more of that, right? <laughs> she talks about pop culture. That's got to be amusing. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I guess my so my experience with Kathleen Hale as a crazy stalker is um, I decided to read and review it because I'd seen so many reviews that were just, you know, savaging the book based on its existence right and based on what they interpreted as you know this is like a publisher paying someone to rewarding someone for having done something bad right and uh i came away from it feeling very different like i think it's a really it's a really good collection of essays and i i think without that essay the other essays are also very interesting um there's one that's kind of like a you know lived in journalism piece where she goes to like a tiny eco community, um, you know, population 15 people or something and kind of mm-hmm. tells what that's like. And, you know, just different stuff like that, different kind of typical essays. Um, and some of them are very funny and some of them are just interesting. And um, I think the book didn't get a fair shake because of, uh, People were reviewing the person who wrote the book and not the book. Yeah. And also, I think it, if people have a strong opinion on that event, I really think they should read that essay. And, you know, you mm-hmm. can get it from the library. So you're not like putting a bunch of money in her pocket or whatever. Right. Um, but I think it's I think the event is whether true in her way or the other way is more complicated than it's been presented Yeah, I do think we have a tendency to treat complex issues as simple, and they very rarely are, Um, because I do see both sides of this. I am someone who has been reviewing uh, books on the Internet for, I don't know, over 10 years. I have quite a few on there, and more than once, an author has either commented on one of my reviews or liked one of my reviews, and I've never had a terrible interaction with any of them. But every time I feel like a spotlight has been shined on me, knowing that the person who wrote the book I was talking about has read my words, all of a sudden I, you know, it makes it makes me feel vulnerable. Um, so I understand, you know, having an author who's researching you and showing up at your home could be very alarming. Um, but I also think that we have a tendency to forget that the people we're talking about on the internet are people. Um, And I try never to say anything about anyone, whether an author or not, because there are authors who I have personal problems with their behavior or, you know, whatever. Um, There are some that I've met and I did not did not like. Uh, But I would never write anything on the Internet about an individual that I wasn't willing to say to their face. And I think sometimes we forget that we should live our lives that way. Like it's basic manners. (laughs) I think so. I think you're totally right. And I, I think it's. That's a weird aspect. And I've been on both sides of it as well. Like um, seeing reviews or like comments on things that I wrote that are, you know, mean spirited. Um, yeah. And it's it's hard to just forget about it. 
You know, it's yeah. hard to just let that. I mean, everybody has something like that in their life where it's like, uh, oh, I, I got a performance review at work today and it was like 99 percent positive And there was one minor comment about yeah. like this. And that's the only thing I remember, you yep. know, or that's <laughs> that's haunting me <laughs> days later, even the and the, your boss would, of course, be like. Oh, you know, I had to say something about that, but I mean, it was overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. um, and like being on the other side, I've reviewed books, you know, negatively and then heard from the author. And even when they're nice and stuff, it does feel vaguely threatening in some way. Yeah. And at the same time, it's it's a back and forth struggle because at the same time, I also feel like, oh, yeah, it's good to remember that like this is a real person. Right. Um, who wrote this book and, you know, they tried. Um, they tried to make something that they thought was valuable. And for all I know, yeah. this is their heart and soul. And I just basically told them that their heart and soul was uh, shallow and pedantic. Yeah. <laughs> so, Well, and I've had, um, I've had experiences similar to, you know, well, Kathleen Hale's side of the story anyway where I reviewed a book and I, we're, we're friends on Goodreads. So I know that you were a witness to all of this going down, but I, I reviewed a book and I reviewed it fairly like lukewarm. Um, it was something that I was excited about the premise and then I read it and I felt like it didn't do what I'd hoped it might do, but I didn't, you know, I didn't rip it and, and, you know, up one side and down the other. Um, I was just mainly disappointed and somebody who I didn't know from the internet popped into my comments and started accusing me of, you know, hating certain groups of people and being horrible. And it became that, you know, I'm lazy and you know, <laughs> lots of things. And uh, I was a little bit like, you have, you have no idea who I am, where is this coming from? So yeah, it happens even to people who aren't anyone. Like I'm, I'm not anyone on Goodreads. Yeah. Um, but somehow my opinion mattered so much to this person. <laughs> it is strange. And then, yeah, sometimes someone will pop in there and they're just like, mm, let's just throw every accusation at the wall and see what sticks. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll just see if we can upset this person. Yeah. So, so I guess. Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> I think I it, wish we would all just be slightly better behaved. And I'm a firm believer that as much as possible, authors should read user reviews of their work, because I do think that like people who aren't professional reviewers are going to say things that aren't professional and they're going to hurt people. So why read them? I agree. Yeah, I think staying away from the reviews of your book, unless you're that unicorn who can, you know, read a negative review and just be like, huh, OK. Yeah. I think Does that's, that person exist, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> I think that a lot of people think they're that person until they read that negative review and then they're like, yeah. all right, I'm gassing up the car to go to this person's house. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's that's basically Kathleen Hale is a crazy stalker. I thought it was a really good essay book. If you like um like Sloan Crossley or um I don't know, maybe like a older David Sedaris stuff. Um, you might really Sloan, get into it. And Sloan Crossley's I was told there would be cake. Yeah. Or I, was, I was told there'd be cake. That made me laugh so hard. Yeah. And this has like a similar feel. I mean, I, I have to admit, you know, I'm probably not, I don't know, maybe 15 years older than Kathleen Hale or 10. But, uh, you know, so there's a little bit of like, Oh, this is kind of a different way of writing essays that's a little bit different culture, like a youth culture that I didn't experience. Yeah. Um, but it's not like obtrusive. It's not unpleasant. It's just different. And okay. I, I don't know. I thought it was kind of a nice introduction into that style of writing. And also um, they're just good essays. I think this would have been a very popular book if it hadn't been for this incident and i also think this is something that you might enjoy if you if you like watching like true crime and stuff i mean if you like 2020 documentaries this is kind of a little bit of that feel of like this sort of sort of uh i'm watching the crime happen right and, you know getting insight into it that i 
didn't wouldn't normally have. So if you're into that also, I think that this would be satisfying for you. Cool. All right. So I've got... Do you need a reminder? Let's see. I have Adler, and that's a comic uh-huh. book. Yeah. Um, you'll never believe what happened to Lacey somebody. Uh, just Lacey. Oh, okay. You'll never believe what happened to Lacey. But the Lacey, the author is Lacey Lamar, one of the authors. I was like, I ran out of steam, I guess. Yeah, it's but fine. <laughs> I got the whole thing. And then there's a curious beginning. Yes. Um, I don't know. I'm tempted by the comics, but also interested in you'll never believe what happened to Lacey. Do you have a preference between the two? You pick, man. I picked <sighs> mine. You pick yours. <laughs> um, all right. I'll do you'll never believe what happened to Lacey. Okay. But I would uh, like so... if you brought Adler back another time. Okay, I can bring Adler Just back. Just putting that on the month. record. I'll, I'll, I'll make an exception for you. All right. <laughs> Deal. Oh, I'm dropping my laptop. Oh, jeez. <laughs> well, I'll make sure to okay. write down in our uh, podcast charter that this was a an accepted request. <laughs> okay, good. So that, you know, you can't accuse me of breaking the rules later. Exactly, yep. Or I can't accru- accuse you either. either. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So you'll never believe what happened to Lacey is by Amber Ruffin, who um, used to make appearances on the uh, Seth Meyers show. And now she has her own show, the Amber Ruffin show. I have to admit, I don't have cable, so I haven't watched either of these shows. Um, So I am not familiar with her from that, that area of her career. She also did, I think a black lady sketch comedy show, um, I can't remember if that's the title or if I'm slightly wrong, um, but she did that. So she does stand up and comedy and commentary and that kind of thing. Um, and that's how she made, that's her career. Then uh, she has a sister, her sister's Lacey Lamar and Lacey is just, she, she's one of us, you know, she's a normal person. She lives in Omaha, Nebraska and does regular office work. Um, so Amber, um, Amber Ruffin said that she wanted to write this book. Um, they were both born and raised in Omaha, Nebraska. And, um, they, as they grew up, Amber says that Lacey is a small, cute, nice person who, because of the way she comes across to people has become like a lightning rod for racism (laughs) or just like everyday casual racism. People seem to think that they can say anything to her, um, because of how she, you know, presents herself to the world. And so as a result, she has the craziest stories about things that have happened to her. And Amber thought this would be a great way to share those kinds of stories. So the, it's written almost like a conversation between the two of them. I have a feeling this would be great as an audio book, um, but I didn't listen to it, so I can't be sure. But I'm, I'm sure that they both read their own individual parts. In the book, they each have a different font, so you can tell who's talking based on the font, um, which is a fun way to present it. Yeah. Quick way so, to like reference who's talking. Right. Exactly. So she... she they talk a little bit about um, their youth and growing up in Omaha, which uh, has a strong African-American community, but uh, is also very Midwest white. Um, so they've had um, they've experienced kind of both sides of that American life to an extent. And uh, they, so therefore, they have lots of, of stories to share. And some of them are absurd. Um, a couple of my favorites, they range from like just the funny and ridiculous where you tell someone, Oh, you're never going to believe this. And everyone's like, that's insane (laughs) to the like kind of depressing and alarming and like dangerous ones. Mm -hmm. Um, And they kind of build. So it starts at the listen to this. You'll never believe it. And ends in the, this is unfortunately part of the world we live in. So be ready for that. Um, It it does get a little heavy and depressing, but the tone is always super funny. Um, Amber is as a stand-up comedian, she is naturally funny. So it, it never feels like you're being beaten about the head and neck with a large, you know, stick. Right. But it is serious stuff. So a couple of my favorite stories that she told. One is that uh, Lacey was on vacation in Colorado, of all places, and she was in the mountains in what was described as just a, a small tourist town. And in my mind, I was picturing Estes Park. Um, I feel confident that it was Estes Park, but I have no reason for 
for that that feeling. I just feel like it had to be. Could be so, any one of a f- number of yeah. small mountain towns with a taffy shop. <laughs> exactly. It's just one of those towns that has lots of little touristy shops. Um, gotcha. We're all familiar. So Lacey uh, is going into one of these small touristy shops um, to get some souvenirs or postcards or, or what have you, the things you buy at these small touristy shops. And the, um, the teller, like the shopkeeper, rushes over to her and, is, and, and just seems like so excited that she's there and, you know, is welcoming and how are you liking the town? And it's such a pleasure to meet you. And she, Lacey's like, wow, this is the friendliest town I have ever been in. Mm-hmm. And then it quickly becomes apparent that the shopkeeper thinks that she is Whoopi Goldberg. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> And I should point out that Whoopi Goldberg is a good 20 to 30 years older than Lacey. I was going to say, like, if nothing else, she must be significantly younger. Yeah. And also, like, I feel like Whoopi Goldberg is fairly iconic. Like, her voice and her, like, we all, we've all seen her in so many things, right? The color purple and ghost and all of her stand up and. I, yeah. And the view, like we see her all the time. How, and I've seen pictures of Lacey in this book, and they are not similar looking. So it's a little <laughs> astonishing to me. Oh boy! But when she figured out that uh, that's what was going on, she ended up the shopkeeper gave her a free T-shirt, and she decided, <laughs> "What the heck? I'll take it." <laughs> I guess I'll just be Whoopi Goldberg long enough to leave this shop. Yeah, she was like, "Hey, I get all these bad." experiences from like casual racism and might as well get a free t-shirt out of it. (laughs) It's got to be so bizarre because, you know, to be mistaken for somebody, it's like, I guess if it's someone who looked a lot like me, but boy, yeah. Whoopi Goldberg has never, I I mean, has she ever not been on like TV or in movies, you know, in the last 20 years? Yeah. She's She's everywhere. The view, she's on TV like almost every day. Right. If not every day with all of her like old movies being in syndication and stuff. Yeah. I mean, and you, she's just one of those people, if you're online or something, every couple months, it's like, oh, here's a clip of Whoopi Goldberg from The View talking to so-and-so or, you know what I mean? Yep. Like You just see her around. And she <laughs> looks, the, she's always looked like Whoopi Goldberg. Like her hair is pretty similar all the time. Her like dress she had like she has yes. a look she yep. looks like Whoopi Goldberg That's I don't know so it's weird, weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, almost even better is uh, another mistaken identity story which is uh so she was shopping at a grocery store and she was at the till and she was writing a check and on her checks and actually it might have been a debit card I'm not positive but she had like an item either a check or a debit card and she had paid for one of those, you know, you get the the ones with the design on it. So it's not just the boring. Blue oh, check right, right. Bank, or your boring blue, like debit card. Yeah. So she had gotten one that had Harriet Tubman on it. And the um, the teller was like, oh, that's so cool. How did you get your picture on your on your check? Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> And I'm assuming this is like the Harriet Tubman, you know, there's like the one picture that we all see, right? Like the. I mean, three quarter it was profile that photograph of a very old Harriet Tubman in the rocking chair. Yeah. Or it was a like a pen and ink drawing. <laughs> yeah, right. Cause oh, wow. Oh, uh, that's no. unfortunate. That's unfortunate. You know what's funny about that? Just to like go off for a second, I remember there have been on and off campaigns, right, to put Harriet Tubman on uh the twenty? The twenty, yeah. And I remember thinking, like, everyone should just go put them, put her on their debit card because everyone yeah. uses the debit card anyway. Like we're going we're moving away from cash over time and there's less and less cash. They should. I was like, if I worked for marketing for Wells Fargo, I'd be like, we're going to just have her as one of the default options for the debit card. And we'll be like, well, we could do yeah. that. Right. I would. I mean, I would get that. I'm kind of low key obsessed with Harriet Tubman. She was so amazing. I mean, if I got a debit card and it just had Harriet Tubman on it, I'd be like, all right, well, I guess I guess my card is Harriet Tubman. That's fine. I mean, she is she was the first woman to lead a battalion uh, into battle. Isn't that crazy? That's so cool. Yeah. I mean, what what an (laughs) odd thing for someone to 
to think and say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, and the stories, you know, they, they progress from there. You get everything from strangers um, putting their whole hand into her hair and it getting stuck to, you know, being gaslit at work um, and then being in situations where it feels dangerous and threatening, um, you know, being in shops with um, quite obviously racist shop owners um, who are, you know, making threats and refusing to serve and all of that stuff. So it goes from the funny, like she doesn't look anything at all like Whoopi Goldberg to the alarming, like this, um, this department store security clerk took a child and separated her from her, like took her and put her in an office for interrogation without notifying her mother. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. The things that happened and, you know, bi- their parents' business, um, was ruined, you know, or was under threat of being ruined. They ended up just selling it rather than, than watching the inevitable decline. And so lots of stuff that it's, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a white person and have never directly experienced anything like these stories. And I think therefore it's sometimes easy for me to not see where they might happen because Mm -hmm. I have no experience of them happening. So I think stories like this are useful because it gives me, it shows me where the hole might be the thing that I might be missing so that maybe I won't miss it so much. Hmm. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds interesting. Like overall, would you say you're reading it and like, it sounds like there's highs and lows as far as. uh, Yeah. I would say it's always funny. Um, Even when it's horrifying, it's funny, but because the implications of it are so serious, I couldn't just sit and read the whole thing at once. Right. You know, I would find myself laughing even as I'm like, I can't believe I'm laughing at this. This is horrible. Right. And then I would have to put it down and be like, okay, like that's enough of that for now. Yeah. Okay. So you would but say. But it's always funny. Her voice is super funny. Um, she's a funny person. I gotcha. think I, I feel confident saying that. And she has, you know, a lot of perspective. Like I think she's tired. Um, and she, she writes about why they wrote this book was partially, she said she doesn't feel like she needs to be educating white people about racism. Like that's not how she wants to spend her time. Sure. But if that happens through this book, like she's kind of happy for that. Okay. Mostly it was her way of, of sharing these stories so that other people who have experienced them can go like, it's not just me. <laughs> right. Okay. That's, uh, oof. I don't know. It's yeah. a lot. It's, it's so it's interesting. A lot. Because I guess like, um, you know, people have these incidents or things that happen to them, the stories from their lives, and then they sort of package them in a way of their choosing. And so it seems like, you know, there are definitely a lot of books that package them in a very sincere and earnest and serious way. And that this one sounds like it packages them in a humorous way, not like unserious, but also not... um, it doesn't feel like you're in a classroom or something, maybe. Right. Yeah. This is more like, like I, if I were going to lunch with a friend of mine and that friend and her sister were telling each other or sharing these stories from their childhood and like laughing about it, even the like the horrible, ridiculous ones, it feels like that. Like you went to brunch with people that you know and you like, and they're sharing amazing stories. And some of them you're like, you're a shocked and like dismayed, but there's still that kernel of like, I can't even believe that's possible. Right. And then some of them are just funny. Like who would ever think that you were Harriet Tubman? Yeah. No kidding. And also everyone go look up a picture of Harriet Tubman because we should recognize her. She's an American hero. <laughs> I can picture what I'm assuming the the image was, but I don't know. That also got me off wondering, like, I wonder if there are people who put their own picture on their debit card. <laughs> There's got to be somebody. It just seems like such a weird thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to mention, because um, kind of related to this story and, uh, you know, one that we can definitely feel free to laugh at. So I, I have an older brother and he was in the Peace Corps for two years and he was in Morocco. Mm-hmm. And he was in a very, very, like, rural, small part of Morocco, um, working in a school and doing all that stuff. And so for a lot of people where he lived, 
um, and worked at that time, you know, he was the only white person they'd ever seen. Right. Or, you know, definitely the only one they'd ever talked to and whatever. And that wasn't the case. Interacted with. Yeah. And that wasn't the case with everybody, but many people where he lived. Um, At one point, my mom and I went to visit him. So uh, we definitely got a lot of interesting looks because seeing like three people walking down the street three white people in that area walking down the street together was like, what is going on here? (laughs) Very unusual. Um, But he, the comparison that he got and uh, he looks nothing like this person. And I'm not saying he's more or less attractive than this person, but the comparison he got all the time was Jean-Claude Van Damme. (laughs) Not all the time, but more than once, uh, you know, that was who he was compared to, which was very strange. And apparently Jean-Claude Van Damme was very popular in that part of the world at that time. And I think it had to do with a lot of his movies are translated into French and a lot of people Uh speak Arabic and French. Um, So anyway, I just that was my favorite thing that from when he came back that they were like, you know, you kind of look like Jean-Claude Van Damme. And I was like, what are you You talking about? I have met your brother. And yeah. I feel confident in saying he does not look anything like Jean-Claude Van Damme. Yeah. Now, to be fair, he was often doing the splits across a countertop. So I could see. Oh, uh, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a friend in college who went to Japan to teach English for a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, she got compared to uh, Kate Winslet. Hmm. Uh, they do not look anything alike. But yeah. Titanic was very popular at the time. <laughs> see. Well, and I will say that they're following the rule and the primary rule of comparing someone's looks to someone else is the person has to be known for being attractive. Sure. So if you want to compare someone to Jean-Claude Van Damme at that time, go for it. Or Kate Winslet at that time. And you're like, yes, great. Go for it. (laughs) I had. Yeah. I mean, who's going to complain, right? Yeah. I don't think I look anything like them, but, you know, I'll take it. Yeah, that's fine. (laughs) I'm going to take that as a compliment because that is a, you know, that Jean-Claude Van Damme in the 90s was a good looking dude. (laughs) He's still not bad looking now. Yeah, I'm I'm sure. I can't say that I've seen pictures of him. He just. Is he still, you know, the one thing. No, that was. um, Who's the other one? Steven. Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal. I was thinking of Steven Seagal. Yeah, Steven Seagal was never the. uh the beefcake that Jean-Claude Van Damme was. Yeah. And, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme. I was watching Van Damme. the Oscars one year, and I don't know why, but Steven Seagal was there, and I was watching the red carpet, and somebody asked him about his ring that he was wearing, and he said, this is the ring that I use to meditate when I need to meditate. <laughs> and it's the one thing I remember about him now. He's, he's a very strange man. Yeah. He's done some odd martial arts demonstrations. And then he had a brief reality show where I think he was a sheriff or a sheriff's deputy. And it was like, wow, cops, I was unaware of that. But starring Steven Seagal <laughs> for some reason. <sighs> yeah, he's a strange one. So, yeah, I, you know, if anyone wants to compare me to a like uh, muscle brown, muscle bound action star, I'll take it. Mm. I always did think that you looked like a shorter Chris Hemsworth. Oh, that's perfect. There you go. You didn't you didn't have to say shorter because we're on like an audio <laughs> format. So no one would know, but <laughs> I'll accept it. I assume he's pretty tall there. He's very tall. I'm pretty sure. But also <laughs> I can't make it like just a full suck up compliment. That's fair. Got to pull that punch a little bit. That's fair. Yeah. I mean, comparing someone to Chris Hemsworth, that's like a. It's pretty good. Yeah, that's going to give me an inflated ego. So it does need yeah. a, a pullback. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> well, anyway, that sounds like a, a interesting book and like. It's timely, too. I think it's it's something that I think a lot of people are thinking about with, you know, all of the, the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd and all of that stuff. So it seems like an opportunity to maybe consider some experiences that might be unfamiliar to you in a way that that is still entertaining and funny. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that sounds that to me when you describe it is kind of what makes it stand out is like, well, maybe if, uh, you know, some of the more serious minded academic type things don't appeal to you, maybe this would be a different way to sort of experience the same ideas, but in a, a way that's more speaks to you more. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's it's accessible. It feels like, you know, normal people. Yeah. Telling stories about their lives. Yes. Yeah. It's like someone that you're like, oh, I would like to hang out with this person. I think they'd be yeah. fun. It's Your funniest a, friend. Yeah. Telling their weirdest stories. <laughs> oh, boy. That's a rabbit hole. We're not going there. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's review. I had yeah, let's. Um, Providence by Max Berry. And I know that's available in print. And I think that's also on Overdrive as well. Okay. And then Kathleen Hale is a crazy stalker is also available in a few different formats. Do you want to talk about the two you didn't discuss? Oh, you yeah, I could request. just very briefly. She-Hulk Single Green Female, that is on Hoopla uh, by Dan Slott. That's the first volume. Um, just one sentence sort of premise summary is um, She-Hulk is in her alter ego. Jen Walters is a lawyer and she gets hired by a law firm to kind of handle superhero legal cases. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is great. And then also I have to admit, that sounds kind of awesome. Yeah. And it's got like a, an extra funny to me, like very sitcom premise, which is the, the head of the law firm hires her, but he's like, now I want Jen Walters, not she Hulk. So don't you go turning into that she Hulk. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that kind of keeps it fun. And then the other one was consider this by Chuck Palahniuk. Um, it's a how-to writing book. I highly, highly recommend it. It's um, even if you've never really thought you wanted to write something, or you know, even if you're sure you don't want to write something, it's an interesting um, look at like storytelling and how you can kind of uh, present stories. And so, ugh, this sounds artsy and cosmic. It's just kind of like what the purpose of stories in the world. Like, why do they exist? And yeah. Um, well, I think that a lot of us who are readers, you know, feel the importance of narrative in our lives, you know, whether it's books or, you know, movies or any kind of like storytelling. Yeah. And so I definitely feel that he talks a lot about those kinds of things and like, you know, some of the elements of um, he's talking about, like, how come in Disney movies, the parents are always dead. And, you know, he talks about that of like, well, a reader can experience a uh, a good feeling because if you present to someone a story where the worst possible thing they can imagine has happened. And so for like a small child, that's probably their parents dying or, you know, losing their caregiver or whatever. Um, and you can show that a character can get through that and succeed and have a good life that mm -hmm. gives people hope um, yeah. and makes them feel like they can get through the things in their life that are difficult. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's funny because it's not like cynical. You would think it'd be very cynical coming from him. Um, yeah. But it's he almost comes off as feeling like storytelling is like an act of service for him. It's yeah, a, I like that. Yeah. It's, I definitely feel that way as a reader. I'm very grateful for storytellers. Yeah. It's I don't know. It's kind of beautiful in that way. Yeah. Great. Um, and okay. then I had Kathleen Hale is a crazy stalker by Kathleen Hale. Okay. Cool, cool. Uh, I had A Deadly Education by Naomi Novik. Uh, this is the dark Harry Potter. It's available in print uh, as an ebook on Overdrive, and we have copies on order in Spanish for anyone who reads in Spanish or would like to practice their Spanish. Uh, I also discussed You'll Never Believed What Happened to Lacey, which is co-written by Amber Ruffin and Lacey Lamar. We have that in print. It's uh, an audio ebook on Overdrive for anyone who wants to try it in audio. I have a feeling it would be great. Um, I also talked about, or I didn't talk about Adler by Levi Tadar, uh, illustrated by Paul McCaffrey. This is the graphic novel that I will bring back as an option for next month. Um, but if you'd like to read it in the meantime, we have it in the catalog in print, and it is available digitally on Hoopla. And finally, A Curious Beginning by Deanna Rayborn. Uh, which is the first in a mystery series, the Veronica Speedwell mysteries uh, that take place in the late 1800s. And it, we have that available in print and as an ebook on Overdrive. Awesome. Um, there you go. So just as a, a small preview for next time, um, we're going to be talking about some books that are not uh, directly available from High Plains. 
And, you know, we'll just throw the curtain back. The reason we're going to talk about that, interlibrary loan numbers are not as high as they've been in the past. Um, so we want to see if we can uh, maybe interest some people in some other things and kind of also just sort of as a way to tell you all about like, hey, just because you don't see something in the catalog right away doesn't mean you can't get it from High Plains. You still can. Right. There are lots of great methods. And a lot of times it's really fast. It's pretty efficient. Mm -hmm. um, so it really does help, especially occasionally you'll come across something that is uh, ridiculously expensive or hard to find. And a lot of times there's some university library that's kind of sitting on the shelf for some reason. And yeah. You can borrow it from them. Well, and we do our best to to buy as much as we can, but there are so many books in the world that there are inevitably things we don't we don't add. Oh, so absolutely. this is a way to still get your hands on them. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you know, sometimes you've got, you know, let's just say a hypothetical reader who's got very niche tastes or something <laughs> and Maybe they are um, looking for something like a clown fellas. Yeah. And maybe they feel like, you know, it's kind of reasonable that the library doesn't have this, but I still want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anyone else is going to want to, but I do. <laughs> so that's a, that's where we'll be headed next time. So get excited yeah. for that. All right. Well, thanks for talking to me. Yeah, it was good to talk to you. And uh, we'll see everybody next time here. Bye. Talk to you. Thank you.